thank you very much for joining us here uh, on what promises to be a very interesting, exciting, and provocative conversation. Uh, you know, post-lunch sessions are always the hardest to do, but I'm going to try and make this as, as interesting a session as possible. And my job has been made a lot easier because of the panel that I have here with me. Uh, the tallest leaders of corporate India, not the tallest women leaders of corporate India, but some of the tallest leaders of corporate India here with us on this panel. Why is it so important to talk about gender parity? In fact, uh, since uh, the Vicky McKinsey report that has been released today identifies strengthening gender parity as one of the urgent areas that requires attention and intervention of the priority areas that have been identified in the report to be able to unleash and unlock India's true potential. Now, a lot has been done, but we have a long distance to cover to really ensure that we see gender parity as a reality in this country. Uh, the hard facts are, and those are facts that we don't like, but that's the reality that we must acknowledge, that we have seen a continuing decline in the participation of women in the workforce. While there have been several measures taken by the government by way of mandates, especially to try and improve representation on boards, that really is uh, the the, the sort of outcome side, what needs to be focused on is what do you do to ensure you can actually achieve the results, you can actually meet the targets without having to resort to things like reservation. How do you expand the funnel, so to speak, are some of these issues that we will be discussing here today. As I said, I have with me the very best of India, Inc. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Kalpana Morpari. I don't know how many of you know this. Uh, she, of course, has been around for over four decades now. So her story, uh, in that sense, has been retold several times over. But Kalpana Morpari, uh, as a law graduate, who decided to join ICICI Bank in 1975 in the legal department uh, to the many changes that you saw through the course of your career at ICICI Bank and then, of course, at J.P. Morgan. And as you sit here today and you look at India and you look at the issues that we are talking about with respect to gender parity, how much has changed, how much remains the same? You know, in some ways, if you look at the number of senior women in financial services, I must sadly admit that actually we've regressed a little bit. We have Naina here with me, and I remember at one time, we used to very proudly say that there was a dominance of women CEOs amongst bankers in India. Unfortunately, that's regressed a little bit. But I'm, you know, on the positive side, what I see generally, and I've seen this over the decades, that at entry level, particularly in the services sector, I know it's different in the manufacturing sector, we end up with about 40-60 ratio, maybe 35-65 ratio. But there is a leakage at the middle. And therefore, you see very uh, few women getting to the C-suite. Like Shireen mentioned, you know, we should not really rely on reservations and quotas. I was part of a SEBI committee which first proposed having at least one woman on boards. I strongly resisted it. And at that time, I was very proud that my resistance, actually, we had dropped that recommendation. Since then, of course, the government came up with a mandate under the company law. And I, ask, I must admit to you now that I was wrong then, because probably because it was mandated, that you are now seeing not just one, not two. In fact, I'm on the board of Hindustan Unilever, and we are already two female members, and Sanjeev's brief to all of us in the NRC is, how can we get more women on the board? So certainly that kind of initiative by the government definitely helped. But I think all companies, and this is more about corporate India, should really reflect on the fact that what is it that attracts 40% women at entry level, but then you end up with probably under 10% at senior level. And what is it that we as companies can do to ensure that women continue to rise? What is the flexibility we need to show to them at the time of childbearing, child rearing, et cetera? And so I think the onus is as much on corporate India as it is on us women to ensure that we don't leave the workplace. 
this? Well, yes, you're absolutely right in pointing out that the onus has to be on the corporate sector to try and ensure that there are policies that are designed to ensure that women don't opt out and don't make it easy for the women to opt out. But, Kalp, uh, you know, Kalpana Morpare raised a very interesting uh, comment there, Nena, and I want you to comment on that. But once again, for the benefit of our audience here, you know, another one of those leaders whose shoulders women like me stand on, Kalpana Morpare, Nena Lal Kidwai, many first attributed to Nena as well, uh, and of course was the first woman president of an industry chamber, something that CII uh, uh, took, took time to, took time to get to. <laughs> so, so, Nana, my first, my first question to you. You know, why have we seen this regression in the financial services space where at one point there were so many women at the top and we don't see that today? Why do you believe that's the case? Is it just, you know, a, a matter of sort of timing or do you think that there is something that we need to, uh, to look into, something we need to review? And to Kalpana's point about uh, corporate India taking the lead, stepping up to ensure that we fix the leakages. How much work has actually been done there, and where do you believe the gaps continue to lie? So I think, uh, you know, just on the financial services sector, it uh, was providence that many women were at the lead at the same time. I think when you look at that next uh, layer, there are women in the system, and I have no reason to believe they would not come up through the system. I think that battle has been won. It's been shown to work. It's, it's done in the financial services sector, and it, one that may not need too much priming, because I would like to believe that pipeline is there, and it will continue to throw up the best candidates, and they come up through the system because they're the best, not because they're men or women. Uh, in terms of the leaky pipeline, I think uh, many corporates have moved ahead, but not everyone has. Uh, there's no doubt that people fall, that women fall away at certain stages. Uh, you know, maternity uh, and young children are standard uh, uh, issues. And increasingly, dual career marriages are a given and uh, one or the other has to give way. And I'm happy to say that there are men who are following their wives around, at least a lot of the successful women I know, some of whom worked with me, uh, have seen their husbands move with them as well. So those decisions have to happen. But until society changes, and every one of you guys out there changes, this leaky pipeline is not going to change. I was interested to see a study that was done which said 75% of the younger males today were very happy to have a wife that was working. However, when the question was asked as to what is the role you see for your wife, it was looking after the children, looking after the family, etc., etc. So until we can marry that, that society's expectation of the woman is disproportionately in favor of looking after home and family, and the sh dual duty is not shared, as it is indeed also in the workplace, we will continue to have this leaky pipeline. And I'll just add a third point, and that is in a book I put together, the women CEOs there, every one of them drew inspiration from their fathers. So that's for all of you who are fathers, or hopefully will be fathers going forward, the role you play in guiding your daughter is a very critical one in terms of ensuring that her aspirations in terms of realizing her true self and at work remain. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, the mindset change that you speak of, Nana, is so significant and so important. And speaking of a mindset change, this is, this is my call out to all industry associations. Please do not club a woman's session as a woman's <laughs> session where women are talking to other women. I insisted that we must have men on the table. And Sanjeev Mehta, I'm so glad that you decided to, to, decided to join this panel because there's really no point on women dialoguing with other women about the same issues. The men are in decision making positions at this point in time. We like it or we don't, but uh, hence the decision makers need to be involved with the issues that we're talking about. Uh, Soma Mandal, let me address uh, uh, the very same questions with you as well. And again, for the benefit of our audience, you know, many firsts to Soma's credit, the first woman chairperson of a large public sector behemoth like the Steel Authority of India or SAIL. So Soma, congratulations on that. Uh, and 
An engineering uh, graduate, of course, Soma started her career many decades ago as well and has uh, moved to sail from Nalco. You know, how different or how difficult, how challenging has it been to move up the ranks in the public sector, not in the consumer-facing sort of spaces, but in hardcore manufacturing spaces, which are largely continued to be male-dominated? See, actually, if you really look at it, when I joined, there were hardly any women in that sector. But there, since there were very few women, I think there was no distinction between a man and a woman. We all were like colleagues. The main problem which I feel in the manufacturing sector, which is, is uh, less women join because it's more challenging. So like Kalpana now said, around 40% you have at the joining stage. We hardly have less than 10. And then the problem is most, more, one of the reason is most of the manufacturing units are set in remote areas where the women face a problem after marriage, where how do they settle to wherever the spouses stay. And generally, it's a responsibility of the girl there to decide to relocate to the new location. Yeah. So having said that, I think another challenge which happens is that the inner manufacturing, since roles are challenging, the management, the bosses become too protective. And generally, they do not give the challenging roles yeah. to the women, because of which, in the long run, the girls, the women lose out. So there, I think, I had the advantage of not being treated differently. I took, I did like, I remember a case where maybe long, long back, I maybe in my early 30s, I was asked to go to a remote location. I got down from the station, took a cab. And while I was going there, I didn't know whether the cab driver was taking me to the right place. So I was just looking out and looking at the milestones. If the milestones were reducing, means I was reaching the destination. So it is the trust, it is your, your superiors who has to trust that you should be able to take up the challenge. But more important is if you're, the challenge is not being given to you, I keep on telling the women around, go up, speak up, that you can do the job. So this is where the problem arises in manufacturing because of which we do not have that pool of women who can take up leadership roles. Absolutely. But it is changing. Well, we hope that the change is, uh, is visible and we hope that the change happens soon enough uh, because uh, this is going to be an important aspect, as I said, of unlocking India's true potential. But, you know, on the point that you made, and very often I, I, I've seen this within, within our organization as well and within several other organizations also, that many policies that are meant to be well-intentioned to benefit uh, women actually... Uh, work against them because as you pointed out you know they're not then sent out to do the challenging things they're not given the kind of opportunities that the men are because you're trying to think about no let's keep the women safe let's worry about I think policies need to be designed and should be gender agnostic so that there is a merit-based approach to decisions that actually happen and women get the same opportunities and men also get the same safety net as women. I think if you continue to provide the safety net only to women, I think then you automatically keep the women out of a large number of positions and roles that they should be technically uh, open to and those roles should be applicable to them. Yes, Soma, you wanted to say something? I wanted that. See, today we are talking about gender equality, gender, but some way we need to go ahead and read the gender neutrality policies. But that would take some time. Unless the society thought changes, you won't have, it would be very difficult to go to that place, that position where we would have more gender neutral policies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Prabhu, you know, let me address this issue with you. On the issue of policies, designing policies, uh, you know, as a leader, how do you approach this issue? And do you believe that you're looking at this issue from a different lens because you also happen to be a woman who is leading the organization today? Um, so I think, Shireen, that's a great question. And uh, I think that if we go back to the leaky bucket part of it in terms of where we tend to lose women, there really are two inflection points. There is the trailing spouse inflection point, and like it or not, till date, most women tend to trail after the man because the man is seen as the primary career owner, uh, and that is changing, and that's great. Just over the last little while, we've moved two people from India to the US, and the trailing spouse has actually been a man. And they've gone along with the view saying, I'll find something to do there because this is a great opportunity for you. And so that part, I think, is definitely changing, and the mindset is shifting. 
The second part where we tend to lose a lot of women is, of course, during this maternity uh, break and the leave. And obviously, physiologically, only women can have children, but yeah. parenting is obviously a yeah. dual responsibility. And I think the more we call this parental leave yeah. and we make it gender agnostic, because I know enough men who really, really would love to have more time with their children and a lot of regrets in terms of how much time they manage to spend, especially in the formative years of their children. I think that's an area where we can make a real difference that instead of making paternity leave a two-week thing and maternity leave a six-week thing, I know there's a physiology to it, but can we start looking at parental yeah. leave that is a little bit more gender agnostic? And depending on who is able to do it at what point, I think that becomes a great option to fix certainly one part of that uh, leaky bucket. And does, that, uh, does it mean that I think differently? I don't think so. I think there are a lot of male voices now also clamoring to be able to do both. They want to work. They want to be part of the family. They want to be part of raising their children as much as women want to do it. And the more we give voice to those voices, uh, I think we really help the situation. Well, we're going to give voice to one of those voices here, Sanjeev Mehta. The, the, the microphone is now with you, the lone man on this panel. And this is, this is, I this is very, very so unusual. I am feeling so privileged today. <laughs> <laughs> you should be. You should be on the company uh, of some absolutely wonderful leaders. But Sanjeev Mehta, you know, on, on the issue of what corporate sector, what the private sector, what leaders like yourself can do. And I know that you've managed to actually achieve quite a significant milestone where HUL has got gender parity at least within its R&D division, within its R&D rank. So that in itself is a significant achievement and a significant milestone which deserves an applause. But, uh, you know, what are you as a leader doing to ensure that you do achieve gender sure. parity? Yeah, thank you very much. You know, R&D why we were talking about that because generally in STEM education in India eh, or in R&D specifically only 16 percent are women and we have about 800 scientists and technologists and under the leadership of Dr. Vibhav Sanskiri whom you saw in the afternoon today we have uh, got gender parity yeah but it's not just R&D yeah it's marketing it is HR it is legal and let me tell you that amongst all our managerial ranks, we have reached 45% women, and in the next two years, we will be gender balanced. So it's not just about the management cadre. Now we are putting a focus on salespeople and factory people. Hmm. Yeah, we, are, we have set up a factory in Sumerpur where it is going to be gender balanced at the blue collar level. Yeah. So it can be done. You have to first start with the belief that women can do most job, if not all, which men can do. That's the starting position. The second is, you must believe in the business case. Now look at us. 70% of people who consume the products of Hindustan Unilever, the decision makers are women. And in our company, we should represent our consumer base. Now if we aren't doing gender balanced, or if we aren't bringing in equity, then we are doing disservice to the business. Mm. So there is a very strong business case. Now, then what we have to do is, first is the culture, which is behavior at scale. And the stereotypical image that women have to be confined at homes, which is the injustice we have done to women over centuries, that needs to be corrected. The second is hardware and software. That's so important. You know, I'll give you a very simple example. You know, Prabha and some of you all were talking about that there are certain points where women take a break. And I remember when I came in as a CEO about 10 years back, we did a lot of analytics and we found out a lot of women were leaving when either they were getting married or when they were becoming mothers. And the general perception was that because they have become mothers, they want to take a long leave or get away from work. I asked my team to go back and find out, are they still at home or are they working? We found out 80% of women had gone back to work. Then we reached out to them, did interviews, and we found out the reason was that when they would come back from maternity leave, we would give them soft jobs. Hmm. Yeah, they've got baby at home, they won't be able to take the pressure of HUL. Let's give them soft jobs. And they didn't like it. 
because they thought they will lose in the race and they didn't want this favor from the company. Yeah. So we started a campaign, we will lose no mother. I used to follow up on every woman going on maternity leave and ensure that when she came back, she got as challenging a job as we gave Prabha Narasimha. And we stopped losing mothers. So you need to be very clearly, now when, say, take a case of saleswomen in the field, our distributor salespeople. Now in distributor's office, they aren't used to women working. So the first thing you need to do is ensure they have proper toilets for women. Yeah. Yeah, if you don't do that, you won't be able to attract women. So it's culture, very important. It is hardware, software, and we must remember something. It is not just diversity or gender balance. It is inclusiveness. Yeah, the old saying, it's not about inviting them to a party, but you have to make them dance. <laughs> yeah, you get them in, and then you expect them to behave like men is wrong. Let them be comfortable in their skin. That is when they bring the best to the business. That's what we need to do. I want to address that issue with you. Uh, in your experience, and, and you know, we saw this at ICICI Bank, uh, where there was a plethora of women at the leadership level. What do you think, uh, you know, Mr. Kama did, uh, which was right, which worked, because clearly it did work, that can be templatized uh, and can be made perhaps more relevant for the times that we are in today? Before I answer that, I just wanted to supplement Sanjeev in something that he said. It's not just when they come back from maternity, it's how you engage with them even in that long six-month period when they are on leave. We found in J.P. Morgan that most women did not want to be cut off from the office. But the managers thought we shouldn't disturb them. They are on maternity leave. Let them have their time with the baby. So we would ask the women that would, would you like to remain, continue to engage with us? And most of them said yes. I had research analyst who was on her six month maternity leave and she was writing research reports from home. I had to remind myself that this lady is not in office and she's doing the research out of home. So, and this was way before COVID trend yeah. of working yeah. from home. Uh, so Shireen, you're going to be disappointed with my answer on ICICI. But ICICI was truly one of those really, really bizarre uh, coincidences where so many women thrive. Because frankly, we did nothing. We did not track uh, hiring. We did not track attrition on gender basis. We did not track career progression, compensation, none of it. And there, that's why we believed that a gender agnostic yeah. organization will just happen. And when I went to J.P. Morgan and they told me, please address a women's network session, I said, no, no. Women don't like to be singled out. I'm not going to do it. J.P. Morgan, of course, forced me into doing it. And I realized the true merit of doing this because ICICI was an island. The world is not an island. Yeah. And therefore, we as companies, and we put in a whole lot of practices, including the one that I just now described to you, in terms of staying engaged with these women, even when they were on maternity leave. So I think cut to where we are today, uh, I would put a lot of emphasis on creating women's network group. Men are welcome, but we women are just as happy being by ourselves because men tend to bond over a, a bottle of beer or their sporting event. Women always want to run home as soon as the work is done. But when they are invited to an office function, they feel obligated to show up there. They meet other women. Your similar challenges that they faced, and actually you create a phenomenal network of bonding. I'm not going to talk about more. I'm sure my other colleagues have more, but there are a few other practices if time permits, I'll talk to you. I, I'll come back to, to you on that. But, uh, you know, Nana, let, let me address this issue with you. Since we are talking about what needs to be done and we're charting out a roadmap to 2047, uh, what do you think uh, the private sector can do to ensure that we not just attract talent, but we create merit-based organizations. And as Kalpana was saying, and I've always sort of felt hesitant about this, I mean, should we address the women? Should we not address the women? Uh, you know, but I think the fact of the matter is that affirmative action 
does have its merits. I was, I was of the same belief that there should be no reservation for women at the board level, but I have also come around to your point of view that if, if it hadn't happened, we perhaps would not have seen more women uh, on, on boards. But, you know, where, on this journey now, in terms of the unfinished tasks, what would you put down? So I was actually grinning when Sanjeev mentioned toilets, and that may be partly because I'm obsessed with sanitation, an area I work in now. And the one good change that's happened is uh, I had to walk up four floors to go to a woman's loo. And today, at least, we can boast a bank of toilets not stuck behind a cop here and indeed available. So that's progress, that there's recognition that uh, women's toilets should be on the same floor that women work on. Uh, and I think these changes, and I call these even the hygiene level changes, don't come naturally to organizations. They have to be understood, felt, and women have to ask for it when it doesn't exist. We shouldn't be shy of making those demands or pointing out what is wrong. And I feel that often we are shy. Uh, we don't want to stand out. We don't want to be seen as if we are asking for special things. But these are not special things. These are required things. And I think Kalpana is so right in suggesting that the cohort that you actually hire needs to be one which is representative at a minimum. So I would say if you're hiring at an IIM and if it's 30% women there, at least make sure that 30% of the people you're interviewing are women. Ideally, 40. But at least go by the grouping that you are going into to ensure that you are meeting them. Then the panel that interviews, can you make sure that there is at least a senior woman there? Because women like to see that there are senior women in an organization before you put your hand up to join it. You want to know what the culture of that organization is. And the policies, many and maybe even every company today boasts about the tick box exercise. But what is the true culture of that organization? Is it truly gender agnostic? And it has to be gender agnostic. I don't think it should be one that favors women. Women don't want favors. I did a study at a time uh, when I was CEO of HSBC, and it was largely women, and I put as head of it the guys who were reporting to me, so they could hear it from the women. But some of the most amazing policy changes came from that. We switched to a five-day week because the women highlighted that that was something that would be helpful, but hey, men and women benefited from a five-day week. The bank benefited because we moved to a roster where the branch remained open on the sixth day, but it didn't require everybody to be in office six days a week. Our costs went down in terms of electricity. We became the favored bank for people to join, men and women. And I had many in the competition that scoffed at what we were doing and said, even RBI called up and said, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> As six months later, everyone moved to a five-day week. And some took two years to move, but people moved. So sometimes it's just about understanding and hearing what is wrong in order to actually do what is right for the organization, not right for women alone. Yeah, Prabha, uh, you know, I, and I, I, you give me tangible things that have happened uh, at Colgate and, of course, in your previous, uh, previous stint with, with HUL as well, which Sanjeev has been talking to us about, about things that actually work on the ground, things that this audience can take away as possible uh, ideas that can be replicated. So I think uh, certainly speaking from personal experience, uh, the first thing that has absolutely worked is you come back to work after a break and you're taken seriously. And you're taken seriously by being given a job that matters to the organization. And, and frankly, everybody can tell what matters and what doesn't matter. So you can't cloak it in it's really, really important project kind of thing you have to give a job that absolutely matters. Having said that, I think along with the job, you also need to be able to give the flexibility to say there are moments where you can be 110% at office, and there are moments where you step back, even in a pre-COVID world, where you need a little bit of space. You know, your child is unwell, there are situations at home that you need to manage, and you didn't do need the flexibility to be able to manage that space. And as long as the job is getting done, because you will yeah. find that most women actually are quite capable of getting the job done despite that flexibility. I think this combination of being taken seriously, 
getting work that matters, along with the flexibility, really, really important. And I do think that even if you talk gender balance, affirmative action, etc., the underlying core principle of merit over everything else really needs to be upheld. Because the minute you start wavering on that principle, yeah. even marginally, I don't think the men feel good, and certainly the women don't no, feel absolutely. good. No, absolutely. I completely agree with you there. I think that, that has to be upheld. But Soma, you know, from the manufacturing sector's perspective specifically, uh, you know, regulations also often come in the way. And again, I mean, well-intentioned regulations from a safety perspective. Women cannot work at a certain hour. Women have to go back at a certain hour, and so on and so forth. And that also constrains organizations from bringing women onto the workforce. In your assessment, you know, call out some of these so-called well-intentioned policies that are actually holding back women from the workforce. See, very, uh, very right question. Here, what happens, we have nowadays, most of our plants have, the, the manufacturing units also have the, the women in the work flo uh, shop floors. Uh, in certain states, you do not, uh, you do not allow night duty. Generally, these uh, shift duties are rotational. Like if a, you have an A shift, then you have a B shift, then you have a C shift. So when the C shift is a woman cannot do, a man has to necessarily do double C shifts. Yeah. So these are where generally the supervisor would avoid putting a woman on a, C sh on a shift duty because of this. But there are be people are adjusting to it. There are states where C shift also is allowed. So, but there are, there are other issues also like, uh, as you said, safety concerns where what recently, recently they have allowed women to go down in the last two, three years, they've allowed women to go down in the deep mines earlier that we were not allowed. So government is, the policies are coming in to help yeah. women in the, in such, uh, to take care of more women in these shop floor or other issues, but it's, it's going to take some time, I think. And more so, my main worry is the woman, it, the, so, the, the protectiveness of people, that also really bars the woman to really do well in the shop floor. Unless the woman by herself says, no, I want to do this job, it's generally avoided. Sanjeev Mehta, you know, as I pointed out, the Fiki McKinsey report or action plan has identified this as a priority area for the private sector to work on. When we were speaking earlier, you talked about the uh, exercise that you're doing with trying to create innovation clusters. What about this issue? What about this priority? What can we expect industry, the Fiki membership to do specifically on addressing this? Yeah, thank you so much. I think the first thing we as Fiki have to do is in the annual convention, there should be a better representation of women in the room. Yeah, <laughs> is uh, I think in the next couple of years, I'm certain that this would change. Uh, I'll just come to that question, but I'll also talk about ki desh mein badlao kaise aara. You know, we were setting up a factory in uh, Sumerpur, in UP, Bundel Khan mein. And uh, we wanted, like I said, 50% uh, women at blue collar, but the law in UP was that after seven in the evening, you cannot employ women. Yeah. So we went to the chief minister, Yogi Adityanath Ji, and explained to him that we would like 50% uh, of the blue collar people in the factory to be women. But this law is holding us back. So he said, up factory kab khul rahe ho? So we told him we are opening the factory in May, June of 2022. He said, hum badal denge kanun, aur unhone kanun badal diya hai. So it is not that the change is not happening, but uh, coming back to your question, you know, the female participation in work is in 20s. Yeah. And uh, again, there is a social issue, question about uh, inequality, inequity, but we are losing seriously when it comes to economic growth. Yes. And... Uh, if we were able to double this from 20 odd percent to nearly 40 odd percent, this will have a significant impact on India's GDP growth per annum. And I believe that the delta growth that we are looking at from the historical growth 
of 6, 6.5% that the country has delivered in the last three decades to 7.7% what has been built into, a large chunk of that delta growth will just come from increasing women's participation. So there is an economic angle, yeah. just like I explained, there is a business angle. And uh, very importantly, is it has the change has to start at every level. The women have to get more of self-belief. The onus is on men to ensure that we create an enabling environment where women can blossom. And that would contribute not only to the household income, but they would contribute significantly to the progress of the country. You know, and I'll get Prabha and you both to comment on this. Since we're talking a lot about changing mindsets and addressing stereotypes as well, you know, through the brands that uh, both of you uh, put out there in the market and the communication that goes along with that, a lot of the stereotyping is changing, right? Share the load to start with. But what about Wim Black? Yeah, you, you know, the entire Wim story started when Prabha was heading a home care. So while the Wim spoof black ad came recently, let me give Prabha the chance to explain what Wim is all about. Wim, uh, you, you know, isn't it fabulous? A competitor explaining my this, brand, why this, it's such a great this, brand. This is a milestone moment. Prabha, go ahead. <laughs> So I think the genesis of the idea actually came about during COVID because we had a conversation about how women were talking to us saying, it's fantastic that my husband and my children are at home and I love them to bits, but I am finding myself cooking many more meals and washing many more dishes. And that was something that came through throughout. Uh, and actually then when the question was asked that you have your husband at home, do they not contribute to the washing of dishes since they're now at home? The answer was usually not and if I have to get him to wash the dishes, I have to hear for half an hour how utterly fantastic he has been <laughs> to wash those dishes. <laughs> and that was really where the genesis of the idea came that if you're going to brag, do it properly. Here's Wim Black for you to help you brag about how wonderfully you can wash dishes. I'm going to take a couple of questions here if you can raise your hand but it has to be a question and uh, I will give the gentleman the first go and then I'll come to the women. If we can get a microphone across to you, please. I'll come to you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Shireen, exciting. Let me just share with you, Sanjeev, we as a company have 50% board between female and male, okay? And that's a good start for a startup. And uh, coming back from banking, I have a, I'm an international banker, Canada Bank International Division, my observation as a young man in banking was 65% of the staff were women. Now, the challenge and the question. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I really want to see, I'm, I'm, I'm as uh, excited about having women in the team, you know? I wish it was more than 50, but humankind has got 50% women. So everything goes, roots for them, I root for them. And I'm looking, but there are spaces, and how do I handle it? That's the question. There are spaces like sales. Hmm. Tough. Even in, in, I'm talking about, I, I'm from Mumbai. I wouldn't find a problem in Mumbai, but in Delhi, I found a problem. How do you get women yeah. in sales or positions like that? That's a challenge. As an entrepreneur, how would, how could I ask for a great, or five great ladies, the solution to this problem? How do we encourage people in recruitment? I've asked placement agencies, why can't there e be equal representation among the candidates you send me for interviews? Why are there 99% men? Mm. How do we handle such a situation? I've just given an example in sales, but it could be in any area. Sanjeev Mehta, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah. You know, the best way would be that, uh, again, I'll bring it back to Prabha here. Prabha is a marketeer by training. And uh, she has led uh, two big branches, North India and South India. Yeah? The turnover in these two branches would be running into 30,000 crores, say. And Prabha, just give an idea how, what enticed you to move to sales and how you did a great job in sales. I'm, I'm absolutely loving this, by the way, this, this. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Prabha. Uh, yeah, I think, um, thank you, Sanjeev. I'm now struggling a little bit. Uh, I, I think the, 
the job itself just super exciting and as we've all been discussing that if you throw women or you throw anybody a challenge that seems exciting they are going to accept it it's not about gender that women are going to shy away from it we potentially maybe don't give women the challenge often enough and if one is lucky enough to have these challenges thrown then we'll surely take them but to your question i think the second thing that i'd love to add is that if you start having a cohort of women one woman it's really quite hard you start having a cohort of them and i think that was mentioned as well by naina it starts making life a lot easier so if you are looking to recruit in a place maybe a mumbai and you look to get three four five of them uh, it does become easier and we have seen examples of that working better than trying to get one woman across you know 10 locations thank you very much prabha yes ma'am you had a question go ahead I i'll come to you in just a second yes go ahead Thank you. I'm Uma Reddy. I run an SME. I manufacture electronic components in Bangalore. Um, I come wearing a woman entrepreneur hat. And it was really nice to hear, uh, you know, kind of share similar notes. All of us struggle in the same manner. But as corporate, do you also look at supplier diversity? You're talking about diversity at the workplace, and we do it at the SME level. We try to employ more women. But I uh, would also like to understand if there is a thought process on supplier diversity also. From yes, any, yes. From so any of the panelists. Thank you. Actually, you would know that the government informed that, like, since I have the sale is a government, government sector, the government does have a policy for MSMEs, for MSEs, where 25, I think 15% is for the MSEs, but 4% has to be from, or 25 total has to be from, from women. So, so for women entrepreneurs, we find it problem to get women entrepreneurs. So, so I think some way you, you need to, yeah. you would be able to, because we keep on, we, we fail at that. Most of the CPSCs are failing at achieving that target. Achieving the target of MSCs is not difficult. So yeah. here, the government has supportive policies. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. We do have an organization by the name Ubuntu Consortium where we're trying to get all the women entrepreneurs. Yes across India onto one platform. So we'd be happy to share with you also. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yes, uh, if you can give the microphone to, ma'am, if you can stand up. There's a, there's a mic right behind you. Ma'am. Right behind you. Yeah. Uh, very short question to all the panelists. I'd like the views of all the panelists. What is your opinion about uh, reservation for women? Is that the right solution? Is that a viable solution? Reservation. Nena, you want to start? I can take that, and uh, I think Kalpana alluded to the reservation on boards, and I'm, you know, of of the view that I don't like reservation, and women don't like reservation because they want it to be known that they've made it on merit, not because there was a reservation. However, given what slow progress, pathetic progress we were making on the board issue, the progress that has happened from where we were to now the 18, 19% on boards has only happened because of the reservation at board level. So I think this needs to come, but it comes at a point of time and it needs to go away because as organizations then begin to compete, well, hey, by the way, I have two and I have three, and foreign investors are beginning to insist on this. Uh, we are seeing some of the best managed companies in the country now. Uh, you heard uh, Levers now has two women on the board, maybe hopefully aspiring to three. Most of the boards I join, I join on condition that we should see at least 30% women on the board. And I don't have to fight for it. So uh, the fact is that well listed companies that understand the significance of gender diversity because it makes good business sense are uh, already have embraced this idea. And it's absolute nonsense when people say, where are the women? Yes. Because for every woman who becomes a board member for the first time, there was also a guy who became a board member for the first time. So why are we only looking for women that have board experience? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Kalpana. Can I say something? I think the one area where we really need reservation is in the legislature and the parliament. Because there the door is shut. And the only way you can bang that door open is by insisting on reservation. No, but I think you know the, the, the other aspect, and that is often brought into the conversation around reservation on boards as well, is that does it merely then become a 
tick box? Uh, is it really, again, which is the, the, the apprehension even with reservation for parliament, uh, is that does it open up the club only for family and friends? Or is it really in the spirit of larger inclusion? And I think that's a concern that has been raised. Shirin, uh, except that I would be in favor of uh, reservation in parliament because we did it at Panchayat and we have seen how the guys put their wives up, but studies have shown, and I think no less than Abhijit, uh, who's won a Nobel Prize now, has pointed this out, that by the third time, the woman is standing there in her own uh, capacity. Right. So it is about change, and there may be this dressing up initially, but it achieves what it's set out to achieve in the longer yeah. run. Uh, last minutes to each of you. Sanjeev Mehta, I'll start by asking you, you talk to us about the aspiration that you have uh, for gender balance within HUL. The single uh, biggest priority that you intend to focus on from the leader's office. Yeah, you know, while uh, we can always debate whether uh, you need reservations, but we must remember that businesses run on targets and analytics. And it's extremely important for us to analyze every aspect of your gender balance journey and uh, have very clear targets. Because at the end of the day, it is like a bathtub. It is about the intake and the outtake. Yeah, so you have to re ensure that your intake is sufficient, that it corrects the pyramid and makes it into a block and your attrition also is in a manner that your intake might be good, but then your outtake might kind of override the intake that you have done. So you need to do all that analytics. And having seen it here, and I believe India is a bit easier. In my previous job, I used to run the business for Unilever in North Africa, Middle East. We made a difference in Saudi Arabia. If you can do a difference in Saudi Arabia, I certainly believe we can do a difference in India. Well, we certainly hope so. Kalpana Morpari, the one thing that you believe corporate India should put its might behind. So one of the things is, as, you, as I mentioned to you, I'm a convert and now actually, you know, a big champion in terms of speaking at events, helping women uh, rise more in their careers. But the one thing I feel really the responsibility lies with the men. And I think it's absolutely important for the men to be sensitized to how their body language, casual comments, actually put off women. And sometimes with the best of intentions, because I assume every human being has good intentions, they might say something that they think is being protective of a woman, but it's actually so insulting to her that she would quit in frustration. So one of the things we did in JP Morgan, and I would sincerely hope a whole lot of corporates adopt that, is actually worked a lot with male managers in terms of sensitizing them, particularly at the time when a woman gets into the childbearing and the child rearing age is to say, treat her like how would you treat your male colleague. She's equal to any task, just don't talk down to her. So that was one thought I'd want to leave. Yes, and, and that's, that's very important because it is part of the sort of sometimes unconscious bias that we, uh, that we carry. Soma? What I would want to, I'm speaking specifically on sale. See, our women leaders generally in the time, the last few years have been mainly in the non-works area, commercial, finance, HR. So th this is a, what I have told my team in the next three to four years. I would like to see a director heading one of our major plants, like whether it's Raurkala, Bhilai, Bokaro, big plants, the big cities. It should be headed by a woman, and that's where I think we all are. Well, more forward. power to you, and we hope that we do see that happen and that uh, dream realized over the next three to five years. Nena? Thank you. Thank you. So I think, uh, yes, data, uh, and keep looking at the data and the outcomes, not just the input, but uh, to look very closely at the culture of an organization. And is that culture one that treats everyone as equal and gives everyone an equal opportunity? And in doing that, it's much more the softer side of an organization, but it needs uh, attention at every level. Prabha? I just want to build actually on the culture point and say that policy just needs to support the culture by being gender agnostic wherever possible. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think you've heard it from the very best here. Uh, uh, and I sincerely hope that over the next few years, we do not feel the need to have a separate session to address the issue of gender parity. I hope that we make significant progress, that this doesn't remain such a big challenge, such a big talking point. But I'm glad that we are addressing it, because it is an issue that requires intervention. It is an issue that requires attention. And it is an issue that requires the collective wisdom and the collective might of corporate India uh, for us to be able to make progress. We hope that when we uh, perhaps get together here at the end of another Fiki National Conclave, there will be better data uh, to support uh, and to present, and we look forward to that. But many thanks to the panel for joining us here this afternoon, and many thanks to the audience as well. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.